Good evening. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the Aims of Education Address for 2019. All colleges and universities have venerable customs, and the University of Chicago has more than most. Appropriate for a university that was founded in 1890 as an engine of educational innovation, one of our most esteemed annual traditions involves thinking about and even debating the aims of liberal education. Each fall, in the week before classes resume and the academic year is upon us with full force, we invite a senior faculty member to address the entering first year class and transfer students assembled in Rockefeller Chapel with his or her thoughts about liberal education, its meaning and value to our lives. The general title accorded to these talks is adapted from Alfred North Whitehead's famous lecture on the aims of education given in 1916 as a presidential address to the Mathematical Association of England. The annual Ames Lecture began as a student initiative in the college in the early 1960s, and over the decades it's become a sturdy and even venerable part of our common and shared history. It is thus part of that system of shared values and our common citizenship that I discussed in the course of greeting you in this chapel several days ago. The first Ames of Education address was in fact a series of lectures on liberal education held in 1961-1962. An important feature of that event was the participation of Robert Maynard Hutchins, who returned to campus for the occasion, having been retired from the presidency of the University of Chicago for, for nearly a decade. Hutchins spoke here in the chapel in the spring of 1962 before an audience as large as this one and he spoke as he, was, as he had always done as president, he had been president of the university for 30 years before an audience uh, as large as this one, and he had spoke, and as he had done as president, he spoke in 1962 in defense of liberal learning. During his presidency, Robert Hutchins gave decisive, decisive shape to the traditions and ideals of liberal learning that still animate and inspire this college. And it is fitting that we honor his memory on this occasion and in, the, and in this chapel. And the aims of education addresses are now published in Hutchins' honor, thanks to generous gifts from alumni who celebrate his role in shaping our culture and our ideals. I should also mention that it is a central feature of this particular ritual that the aims speaker is given absolutely no instructions or substantive guidance from the dean of the college or anybody else other than informing her or him of the time and place at which this lecture is to be held. To be invited to deliver the annual aims address is a considerable honor but also a daunting challenge. And it is no accident that most, if not all, of the AIM speakers in the past have been colleagues, not only esteemed as formal scholars, but also as brilliant teachers. Our speaker this evening is Deborah Gorman-Smith, the Dean and Emily klein Gidwitz Professor of the School of Social Service Administration. Dean Gorman-Smith is both a distinguished and an engaged scholar uh, who serves as the um, Principal Investigator and Director for the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention, one of six such centers in the nation funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She's also a great teacher. Her highly original program of research aims to advance our knowledge about the origins, risk, and prevention of aggression and violence, particularly among minority youth in, in urban communities. She has led several important longitudinal studies of these topics, including a study for the United Nations on violence against children, which produced recommendations for consideration by the member states of the United Nations. Her extensive publications have explored the connections among youth violence, community characteristics, and issues of family functioning. Beyond her impressive scholarly contributions, Dean Gorman-Smith is also a deeply inspiring teacher and mentor who has guided countless students, thousands of students at the School of Social Service Administration and also now in the college to connect, to connect their commitments to serve the most vulnerable members of our society with the most rigorous and creative tools and habits of scholarly analysis. Starting this year, the School of Social Service Administration, or SSA as we call it, will expand its engagement with college students by sponsoring a minor in inequality, social problems, and change which will introduce undergraduates to the tools and methods of the SSA, as well as to the suburb teaching of faculty like Deborah Gorman-Smith. Great teaching lies at the heart of the central purpose of our university. The efforts of our faculty over the past century to create and to define this great university's teaching traditions were often complex because they not only involved structural formalities, 
but because they were infused with a very strong, compelling sense of pride and a profound sense that our work as educators would have a dramatic impact on the resilience of the fundamental values that define this university. That is to say that the vocation of teaching has come to define the highest and best nature of this institution. It is thus a great pleasure and a high honor for me to introduce my a great teacher, my distinguished colleague and friend, Deborah Gorman-Smith, who will deliver the 2019 address on the aims of liberal education. Deborah. Good evening. I'm gonna try that one more time. Good evening. Thank you. So first, um, I want to apologize to the people doing the closed captioning because I'm going off script for a second. Um, and I also want to apologize to all of you. I'm so sorry that my back is to you for all of this. So I just want to apologize in advance. So um, uh, it is my deep, deep honor to be here tonight, and I want to thank Dean Boyer for inviting me to give this address, uh, this address this evening. My 18-year-old self could never have imagined that I would be delivering such a lecture, or frankly, that I would be working at such an institution. Like many of you here, I was the first in my family to attend college and among the first to graduate high school. My mother dropped out of high school because she had to get a job and work. My father joined the Air Force immediately following high school, the first in his family to graduate. And then he worked in a factory, and when those jobs dried up, he became a diesel mechanic. My mother drove a school bus for 35 years. It's a really long time to drive a bus. They were the hardest working people I've ever known, often working multiple jobs to make ends meet. And despite their incredible efforts, living paycheck to paycheck, and sometimes not quite making it to the next paycheck. A college education for them, and for me, was seen as a path to more stable and less stressful life. And it worked. Life is more stable. I'm not sure about less stressful, because I'm super stressed right now. But certainly, it's less economically stressful. But of course, the impact of my education was so much more than that. And here I am in front of all of you, more than 1,700 strong. It's really cool to look out from this space. Representing all 50 states, more than 100 nationalities, languages, and dialects, and more than 200 students who, like me, are the first in their family to attend college. Congratulations to all of you for deciding to study at this great institution. Uh, as Dean Boyer said, when you're invited to present the aims of education, little direction is provided. It's one of the many great things about this university, that there are no prescriptions for how this is supposed to go, other than it better go well. Like all of you, we as faculty are encouraged to think critically, question, push the boundaries of our chosen field, challenge, argue, and I would say argue respectfully, and not be constrained by others' perspective about how an issue should be approached. As I read through previous Ames lectures in an attempt to find some winning formula, something that was incredibly humbling, but also a rare treat and a reminder of the amazing intellectual cap capital here at the university, I found that there was no formula, there was no style or set of messages or even necessarily agreement about what the aims of education should be. So this is my version of the aims, a version that includes a bit of my own journey and some help from the women who founded the School of Social Service Administration, or SSA as we call it, because it's really hard to say School of Social Service Administration over and over again. Everyone in this room recognizes what an enormous privilege it is to receive an education at the University of Chicago. All of you could have chosen to attend any number of other institutions, but you chose to come here, knowing that this is a distinctive place, a place known for academic rigor, its seriousness of purpose, and its commitment to freedom of expression and critical inquiry. 
This university has been committed to the foundational principles of liberal learning that offer students the skills of critical thinking, writing, and argumentation. And it believes that these skills will serve to continuously enrich your lives long after you leave here. This place is the life of the mind. I would also argue that one of the aims of education is, or should be, to learn how to be wrong. I start with this one because I think it's one of the hardest things for us to do, to work hard, to immerse ourselves in information and data, to think critically, to examine an issue or idea from multiple perspectives, and to simply be wrong. I say this as I reflect on my own path as a researcher, conducting studies to understand the factors that put youth at risk for involvement in violence, and to use those data, combined with theory and experience and practice, to design and test programs to prevent youth from becoming involved in violence. My colleagues and I learned a lot over the years, and I'd like to think we advanced the field and made, and made important scientific contributions to understanding the impact of violence in children's development and the factors that increase or decrease risk for involvement. And I'd like to think that our research helped change policy and practice. We developed some programs that had impact um, and had positive effects on children's development and outcomes. But sometimes, over the course of that work, we were wrong. Our hypotheses were not borne out, or our programs didn't work. And when that happened, it was really difficult to take that in. We questioned the data. Were they coded correctly? Were they analyzed correctly? Who put in the data wrong? What if we tried something else? But in the end, after searching for some way to prove that we were actually right, it turned out that we were just plain wrong. And it's really hard to be wrong, particularly when you've spent your life up until now working really hard to be right. But it's important to learn how you can be wrong, misled, or mistaken, and to use the knowledge you attain from being wrong to set yourself on a different course. One of the great debates in higher education focuses on the role of a university in relation to the community and world around it. Is the academic institution a purely intellectual place for the purpose of enrichment, or is it one that has a responsibility to use knowledge for impact, dare I say, to make the world a better place? I believe, and I will emphasize this, the privilege of an education comes with a responsibility not only to enhance your own life, but to arm yourself with the skills and inclination to use your knowledge and education to make a positive difference in the world. Here on campus, there are ample sources to acquire those kinds of skills. This year marks a remarkable moment in undergraduate education at the university. For the first time, all parts of the university all schools and divisions are engaged in undergraduate education. The University of Chicago is distinct in having undergraduate education focused in the college, including a core curriculum, but also offering students the opportunity to take courses offered through any unit, division, or school across the university. This includes the Law School, the Harris School for Public Policy, Booth, the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering, and now, as you heard, SSA. And why is this significant? Why was this so important? We face an increasingly com complex world, and I realized the exact same thing was said when I entered college, but it's true. The world keeps getting more complicated. There is no one discipline that has the answers to the kinds of complex issues you will face. And when I say face, I don't necessarily mean ones that you will face in your chosen profession, but issues that we face simply by existing in the world. Despite advances in technology, research, and economic growth, society continues to struggle with seemingly intractable social problems, including violence, poverty, economic instability, homelessness, and educational inequality. At a time when cities are re-emerging as hubs of creativity and innovation, large segments of the urban population are being excluded from the benefits of this urban renaissance. 
The city of Chicago, your new home for many of you, clearly represents the challenge. Our thriving downtown is starkly juxtaposed with neighborhoods that have been impacted by years of structural racism, residential segregation, and social and economic disinvestment. Urban and rural areas across the country and around the world are experiencing the same challenge of inequality and confronting the myriad social problems that stem from it. These are not just problems for politicians or social workers or housing advocates or urban planners. These are issues for all of us. How many of you have families that were just a little nervous about you attending a university in Chicago because they feared for your safety given all of the reports of violence? It's a pretty good number. How many of you know people who didn't even apply here because they were concerned about violence in Chicago? It's a fair number of hands. Um, First, let me tell you that Chicago isn't even among the top 25 most violent cities in the country. Let me be clear, I am not saying that violence is not a problem. In fact, as I said, this is my area of research and I've spent my career and part of every single day for the last 25 years focused on this issue. Violence is a public health crisis in this city and in this country. But there are two points here. Uh, well, there are really actually many points, but that's a completely different lecture. One is that data, facts, research, and science are critically important and also increasingly challenged. You will be challenged here to look beyond the headlines, to dig deeper, to examine the data, to go to the original source, to not simply take in information, but to critically evaluate that information. Second, none of these facts, factors, or data points exist in a bubble. They're all impacted by our environment, our families, our friends, our neighborhoods, and their social and political context. Think about where and how you exist in this space, and think of the ways this university can enrich your understanding of your place here. Again, you have the opportunity to take advantage of every school, department, and division at this university. You can't cover them all while you're here, but I encourage you to use this opportunity. Every discipline has blind spots, but also has a body of knowledge and an approach that can change your perspective, offer a new way to think about an issue, or deepen your insights. We at SSA are thrilled for the opportunity for greater engagement with the college. And I'm particularly pleased because, as you heard, beginning this year, we're offering a new minor um, that gives you a chance to take courses that focus on inequality, social problems, and change. In fact, the minor's called Inequality, Social Problems, and Change. Pretty catchy. We look at the interconnectedness of individuals, families, and communities, and emphasize the ways societal and structural forces intervene in the lives of marginalized groups, sometimes producing improvements, while other times resulting in unintended negative effects. If you choose to take any of these courses offered through SSA and a number of other places on campus, you will be pushed to think about the way social markers individually and collectively influence inequities in areas such as mass incarceration, immigration policy, access to health care, political power and participation, and physical and mental health, among other issues. You will examine applied analysis and novel social interventions from across disciplinary fields because, again, enduring social problems cannot be solved by any one discipline or perspective. From its start, SSA has emphasized the need for science and research as foundational elements in social change. SSA was built by visionary leaders who imagined a better world and reimagined a profession. Our founders knew that change would only happen if rigorous research guided practice and policy, and they knew that the school they imagined could only happen at the University of Chicago. I'm going to take a sip of water. A little background about SSA. We celebrate 1908 as the birth of SSA. At that time, before being part of the university, SSA was known as the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy. 
would not become part of the university until 1920, but from the start, the school's vision was unique. It didn't just provide practical training for caseworkers or provide charity or relief services. Instead, unlike other schools of social work, SSA's leaders had a unique vision. They were committed to, to conducting first-rate research on such issues of poverty, working conditions, education, and immigration, and they believed this research should be the basis of an education in social work and social welfare. The leaders insisted that students have a solid foundation in theory and research in the social sciences, but they also insisted that work should be connected to and reflect the major social issues of the time. They believed that education didn't just happen within the classroom or the walls of the school, but also in the community. They wanted their training program to be rigorous and they wanted it to matter. They wanted their students to have an impact on society. This vision started the Chicago tradition of social work education. You quickly will learn here there are many Chicago traditions. It happened during the progressive era when the nation experienced widespread activism and reform efforts. And this new vision was bold, it was a grand experiment, and it was led by women. This happened at a time when women had little power in our society, when a woman's place was in the home, confined to very traditional roles of wife and mother, a time when women, these women, these women that started this school could not even vote. So who were the women reimagining a profession and driving this revolution? There were three of them, Sophonispa Breckenridge and the Abbott sisters, Edith and Grace. All were visionaries, bold thinkers, and brave rebels of their time. They were activists, idealists, and pioneers who imagined a more just and humane world. In the process, they reimagined a profession and created a school grounded in critical thinking and scholarship, research, and active community engagement. Sophonispa Breckenridge was born into a distinguished and prominent Kentucky family and is, was described as the belle of the bluegrass as a girl. A university press release announcing a reception to celebrate her 50 years of service here at the university described her as the first lady of the School of Social Service Administration with a life story that is a fascinating tale of feminine first. Among her lifetime achievements, Sophonispa was the first woman with a named professorship at the University of Chicago. She helped found the Chicago chapter of the NAACP, was an early member of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, and helped start the Women's Peace Party. Early in her life, Sophonispa was among the first generations of women to attend college, graduating from Wellesley. As you might imagine, opportunities for women in the late 19th century were limited. After graduating, she described her life as confused. She seemed to wander, trying different things. She taught at a girls' school that was near to her sister's home in Virginia for a while and prepared for a career teaching mathematics. But she didn't want to stay there indefinitely. Eventually, she went back home, studied law, and became the first woman to pass the bar exam in Kentucky. Then, in the summer of 1895, she traveled to the Midwest to visit a Wellesley classmate who lived in Oak Park, the suburb just west of Chicago, where I happened to live. It was a visit that changed her life forever. She soon found employment at the University of Chicago as an assistant to Marianne Talbot, the Dean of Women. She enrolled in the university's political science graduate program, eventually receiving a PhD. Again, the first woman to receive a PhD in political science here. But after earning her PhD, she faced limited and frustrating opportunities. She said, and I quote, I had opportunities to go to positions giving higher rank and greater pay, but it seemed to me that the university presidents were at the time more concerned with the outsides of their women's students' heads than with their gray matter. So she chose to stay at the University of Chicago, where, as long as she could stay connected with her mentors, university colleagues, and the people who mattered to her most, she was only too glad to scrape along. With the encouragement of her mentors, Sophonispa enrolled as a member of the first class of the University of Chicago's law school and became the first woman to graduate from the law school in 1904. 
Armed with advanced degrees and plenty of ambition, she was appointed professor in the university's department, department of Household Administration, which I don't think exists anymore. Weighing just 90 pounds, she was enormously busy, productive, and energetic. Here are a couple quotes that give you a sense of who she was. I quote, the work of the world is not done by going to bed when you get sleepy, she said. Vacations are an invention of the devil. Just for the record, I don't agree with that statement. Vacations are a good thing. I encourage you to take them. And by now, we all know what the research tells us about the importance of sleep. So I encourage you to sleep, too. Before long, Sofa Nispa was at the Chicago School leading the research department. She, along with Edith Abbott, set about redefining the social work curriculum, emphasizing that the field needs to focus on public responsibility rather than private donations, and that social work training had to be rigorous and systematic. With this vision, the school began training students to examine acute social issue issues in our rapidly growing city. Adapting what she learned in the law school, Sofanispa introduced the case method to courses, and soon students were examining housing and juvenile delinquency. They analyzed the Cook County jail system back in 1915, gathered data in housing after the 1919 Chicago race riots, and examined the economic status of women, among many other things, issues that today still challenge us. In 1920, the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy became, philanthropy became part of the University of Chicago. So in addition to her intelligence, energy, and talent, Sophie Nispe was strategic and political in masterminding this merger, maybe even a little wily. That is, she recognized an opportunity when it allowed her to reach her goals. Case in point. The president of the Chicago School of Civics, Graham Taylor, was lukewarm when the idea of a merger with the University of Chicago was floated. Sophie Nispa, on the other hand, was much more enthusiastic about aligning with the university. She and Taylor often disagreed openly and bitterly about this idea. Then Taylor went on vacation. Not a good idea. And so Finispa was appointed acting president. Seizing the moment, and with Edith Adabit's support and the benefit of Taylor's absence, Sofinispa relaunched discussions about the merger with the university, and along with Julius Rosenwald, a trustee of both the school and the University of Chicago. You can guess what happened next. Taylor returned from his two-month hiatus to find merger discussions in rapid motion and moving toward completion. He was furious, and I've seen the letters he typed, he was furious, and accused Sofanispa of treachery. But in Sofanispa's view, the merger was something in the nature of emancipation, and for the work, it means weakening nowhere and strengthening at many points. Besides, Sofanispa wasn't afraid of a little conflict. She was known to say, I would rather have a good fight any afternoon, even if I got beaten, than to go to a party any time. As I mentioned, she wasn't a fan of vacations and likely didn't look so fondly on Taylor taking one. But the merger was controversial. Even friends in the uh, profession made dire predictions, but Sofa Nispa was steadfast. Edith Abbott, Abbott also expressed this clear vision saying, only in a university and only in a great university could a school of social work at the educational facilities that advanced professional students must have if they were to become efficient public servants of democracy. I'll shift now and talk about the two other SSA founders, Edith Abbott and her younger sister, Grace. Both sisters were fighters and came from a family of activists. Their father was Nebraska's first lieutenant governor. Their mother, a Quaker, was involved with the Underground Railroad and the women's suffrage movement. Both sisters lived in Hull House, members of, of a vibrant settlement house founded by Jane Addams, surrounded by other female activists. Each sister searched for and found distinct ways to express her own activist values. Together, they were a unique team. Edith, more academically and theoretically inclined, and Grace, a more public and pragmatic figure. Edith was appointed the first dean of SSA, becoming the first female dean of any graduate school in the United States. 
and it happened here at the University of Chicago. And it's fitting that we celebrate her achievements because she was born today, September 26th, so it's Edith's birthday. Edith was also a UChicago alum, having received a PhD in economics here. She studied at the London School of Economics, taught at Wellesley, and then accepted the chance to work at the Chicago School of Civics and Philanthropy. This move stunned colleagues who couldn't understand why she would give up a prestigious post to work as an assistant director promoting social work education. But either Edith viewed the move as a chance to build on and advance her economics education and expand her social theories and interests. Edith always believed that the school needed a connection to a university. She said, and I quote, a good professional school of social welfare not only needs a close connection with a good university, but the modern university also needs such a school. Edith recognized the fine balance needed to integrate theory, evidence, and practice, and the need for hope and confidence in finding solutions, saying social workers need to be thinkers, but they should be idealists as well. As soon as Edith was appointed Dean of SSA in 1924, she began making innovative changes, integrating the university's resources and continuing to remake and reimagine the profession and the training of social workers. As a forward thinker, Edith believed in a more nuanced understanding of social problems. Complex problems required complex solutions. She championed an interdisciplinary approach to curriculum that was unheard of at the time. Students were required to have a, a solid theoretical foundation of the social sciences, the ability to understand statistics, a solid understanding of the historical and political causes of social problems, as well as an understanding of the legislative and policy-making process. I will add here that Edith, as an economist, strategically and intentionally built a school around a multidisciplinary faculty, an intellectual tradition that continues at SSA today. This is a school that has and always has included a faculty in social work, psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science, public health, economics, and more, because again, different ways of thinking, knowing, and being are valuable. Bringing multiple disciplines under one roof in pursuit of shared goals, but sometimes taking paths to get, th get there makes us better. To further advance the school's dedication to scientific inquiry, Edith, along with Sofonispa, launched a scholarly journal, the Social Science Review, that would spotlight the research and evidence-based practices of current investigations. She was the journal's longtime editor, and we're pleased to continue that tradition today. Edith, an economist, was known as a passionate statistician, but she was also a successful collaborator, applying her work in the real world. She helped establish the Cook County Bureau of Public Welfare and worked to reforms that would end the exploitation of immigrants. During her career, she reimagined, she remained a demanding and apparently a sometimes scary teacher but her devotion to her students was unshakable. She said, I sometimes break appointments with others, but never with students, for students are really important. Edith's younger sister, Grace, was a long time, uh, was on the front lines fighting for children's rights, was one of the most powerful women in government in her time, and was named as one of America's 12 greatest women in 1931. She served as the chief of the U.S. Children's Bureau, was the first woman nominated for a presidential cabinet post, the Secretary of Labor for Herbert Hoover, and the first person, the first person, sent to represent the U.S. at a committee of the League of Nations. Grace was a woman of fascinating contradictions, something you might not be able to find today. She was a lifelong Republican Party member and a lifelong liberal activist. She was a native of Nebraska Plains Frontier who spent a good part of her adult life living among poor immigrants in urban Chicago. And she was an unmarried woman described as the mother of America's 43 million children. Early in her life, she taught high school in Nebraska, then attended a summer program at Jewish Chicago, and subsequently moved to Chicago to study full time also graduating with a PhD in political science. And while still a student, she founded the Juvenile Protection Association. 
She had an amazing career trajectory. Think of this. At age 29, she was still living at home with her parents, working an unassuming job as a high school teacher in Nebraska. Then she moved to Chicago, got her PhD, lived in Hull House with her mentor, Jane Adams. She became a courageous, bold, and defiant advocate, speaking up and seeking out ways to improve the lives of children and immigrants. She became director of the Immigrants Protective League and became the first person appointed by the U.S. to a committee of the League of Nations. Then she was appointed the chair of the U.S. Children's Bureau, leading a national fight against child labor. So in just little more than one decade, Grace went from modest school teacher to being the most powerful and highest ranking woman in the entire U.S. government. In so doing, she became an important role model for future generations of women in public service and leadership positions. And perhaps not surprisingly, male politicians at the time attacked Grace and her trailblazing efforts, calling her a, quote, menopausal maniac with the Mussolini complex, among other things. But she was also defended by Eleanor Roosevelt, who called her one of the greatest women of our day. And at her death, other lawmakers paid homage to Grace and her achievements, saying that Grace's influence will extend to future generations, not only in our own country, but in many parts of the world. One congressman said, to me, there was something about Grace Abbott which always suggested Joan of Arc. This is quite a legacy, and not just for SSA or for me as dean, but for the university and for all of us in this room. This is true for several reasons, but two of note. First, the University of Chicago was one of the few places in the country at the time that would embrace women as leaders. Second, this school reflected an important aspect of the vision of a great university, that education is not just for the purpose of enriching the lives of the students coming through these doors, but for those who come through these doors to also use all that is gained for greater impact. So what lessons can we learn from the experience and achievements of these three women? What do they have to do with education and the experiences of head of you now that you're at the University of Chicago? I would offer a few. First, take the long view. We face a world with extreme challenges that requires nuanced and imaginative thinking with few shortcuts. Think about SSA's founders who imagined a better world and reimagined the profession. Some called it a great leap of faith, but they believed that change could only happen through rigorous research to guide practice and policy. And it didn't happen right away. Some of the founders took very circuitous paths to get where they ended up. They got shot down and they had to deal with naysayers. They scraped by sometimes, but they found their way and in the end they created a school, redefined the education training and research of social work and social welfare, and impacted the lives of children, families, and communities across the country and around the world. Be open-minded and prepared to use your talents and patience to find solutions. Be active use your agency, and engage. Second, passion and a good heart are not enough. Of course, passion and commitment are important elements to driving change, but passion and good intentions just don't get you there. You need critical thinking, decisions based on research and evidence, because meaning well, simply meaning well, without informed analysis is not enough. Third, learning and knowing. A lot of the most important learning you will do will occur outside of the classroom. I may be one of the few people here that will tell you that. You have a mix of talents and exceptional resources surrounding you. Learn from faculty, but also learn from fellow students, staff, and people who you meet in the community. Seek out new experiences. Engage in the many student organizations on campus. Volunteer. Explore Chicago neighborhoods. Some of your most memorable learning may occur outside of the classroom, in discussions with your friends while you're riding the L north to a baseball game, and I did say north, or to a museum or a new restaurant or while walking to a local school to volunteer. Push yourself to try things that are out of your comfort zone. Be present and be thoughtful. 
And finally, optimism, engagement, and debate. Learning, growing, challenging yourself and others, and creating change are not for the faint-hearted. Sometimes it's a lonesome endeavor. Edith Abbott understood this very well when she said, it's not easy to find charts and lights, and you will go forward alone much of the time. Often there will be no traditions to carry you on, only an open road. We have a tradition of academic freedom and free expression at the University of Chicago. We recognize that debate is necessary to challenge the status quo, to advance causes, knowledge, and innovation. Those values allowed SSA founders to flourish and shape a profession. Each of you is here for an education that enhances your capabilities. This place is about rigorous inquiry and learning how to evaluate and confront uncertainty, different viewpoints, and new ideas. Often, the discussions will be uncomfortable. But as Hannah Gray, a past university president, said, education should not be intended to make people comfortable. It is meant to make them think. As I look out, I see a group of students who came to the University of Chicago with different backgrounds and different sets of experiences. But regardless of the factors that led you here, you came here with common values and ambitions. We all came here wanting to engage and learn in a culture that uses knowledge and critical thinking to examine issues, find answers, and may do something to shape the world that as we, to have it look as we wish it to be. It can be hard and demoralizing sometimes to read the news of the day or recognize the slow progress on so many issues. But looking out at all of you, class of 2023, I'm extremely optimistic and uplifted. Welcome to the University of Chicago. Take the long view, think ambitiously, and as Edith Abbott said, continue to keep your sense of idealism. Thank you, good luck, good night. I want to thank Deborah for her uh, highly informative and indeed highly inspiring remarks. Uh, it's now our custom that we will divide, return to your houses, and continue the conversations about the aims of liberal education. I and all my faculty colleagues wish all of you a safe, productive, and a very stimulating academic year. Good night and good luck. <laughs>